Katie Kimball here for the Healthy Parenting Connector, where as always, we are here to connect you, parents who so desire to raise healthy, independent adults with the experts who have the information you need. Today is a solo episode. We're talking about picky eating today. And I gotta tell you, I was uh, being interviewed for a podcast the other day, and the host asked a question that I don't think I've ever been asked. She said, but why? Katie, why? Does it feel like there's so many more kids who are picky eaters these days, right? Like we didn't really experience this when we were kids. It's, it's like an epidemic. And in fact, we know that during the pandemic, picky eating has increased, which is the wrong direction, probably because of stress, but we'll get into that. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is such a good question. Why has picky eating increased? And so, I've got at least four theories, and I say at least because I'm still kind of noodling on this, and I'm sure there are more. Um, and I and I know, especially for the more extreme selective eaters, extreme picky eaters, there are biological root causes. There are food allergies, sensitivities, mineral deficiencies, um, you know, like mental health issues, sensory processing issues. You know, there's there's all that going on. But but even there, even the root cause of those, why, why do we have so much more? picky eating? It's, it's a really good question. And so today we're going to talk about four potential theories underpinning the increase in picky eating, which of course lend themselves to four preventative strategies for parents of kids who are, who are young enough that they're not picky eaters yet, or you, you know, you've kept good enough habits that they're not picky eaters. So I'm really excited to dive into this. Um, and I just realized sometimes I can't see the comments. Can I? Okay. I hope I can see the comments. The other day I could not. Facebook changed their system again. Silly Facebook. All right. So the, the reasons that, that I see in all of my research and all of my work with families around the world teaching kids to cook is that there are four places that the picky eating epidemic is coming from. One is culture. One is a change in parenting. Another is in our physiology. And I really have a theory on that that's just my very own. And another is in our psychology. Okay, so let's start with culture. What has culture done since like my childhood in the 80s to potentially cause an increase in picky eating? Well, we've separated kids' meals and adult meals in, in a much more drastic way than was usually done before. We've lowered the bar for what kids are expected to eat. You know, I talk about this all the time. We look at we look at kids' meals in the restaurant, right? Restaurant kids' menus. We look at school lunch menus. And we look at the food in the stores, the convenience food, especially marketed towards kids, right? The chicken nuggets, the french fries, the frozen pizzas, all of these things that make it really easy for parents who are exhausted, for parents who are frustrated, to more easily slide into short order cooking, right? The culture has pushed us. They've pushed our kids palates to be more narrow. They've pushed our expectations to be lower and they've pushed us down a slippery slope, making it easier for us to resort to kid-friendly convenience food. What a mess. This, I believe, is all at the root of an increase in short order cooking, right? Um, we've got we've got hundreds, maybe thousands of parents in our No More Picky Eating Challenge group right now. They've all been introducing themselves and it's so interesting because I asked them the question of, were you a picky eater when you were a kid? And, and everyone's answering that, but at like 90% of the people are also telling me about their current picky eaters. And it's really, really, it's interesting and it's a little heartbreaking. So many moms are saying, oh my goodness, my dream, Katie, is just to cook one meal. My dream is just to cook one meal every night. Wouldn't that be amazing? And, and you know, another mom said, I, I love food. I love cooking. I love sitting down at the dinner table and I'm so tired that it's always a battle. It's a battle every stinking night over vegetables with my 13 year old, right? So we've got, I mean, we've got these, you know, this albatross around our neck and these weights on our shoulders when we come to the dinner table where we want to enjoy our time. We want to be efficient. We want to make one meal and we're not, and we're not. So, so I do think that culture is at the root of some of the picky eating problems we're seeing. They've made it easier. Now, I think parenting has changed a lot. Again, I asked, I asked moms and dads to say, were you a picky eater? And many, many, like an insane amount of people said almost the same words. No, I was not because I couldn't. No, I was not a picky eater because I did not have that option. I was not a picky eater as a kid because I did not have that choice. 
And lots of people are telling stories of sitting there staring at a burger and waking up in the morning and that burger was reheated for breakfast. Or sitting there and staring at the bowl of chili for hours. One, one person said she spilled her tomato soup on herself because she was her, her oma and opa said that she'd have to eat it before she could leave. So she spilled it and they cleaned her up and gave her a new bowl. She was like, oh. Ironically, as an adult, she now loves tomato soup, which is interesting. Every story didn't turn out that way. Lots of the adults say, you know, I wasn't a picky eater as a kid because I had no choice. I was forced to eat what was made or go to bed hungry or, or forced to eat what was made or sit at the table. And I don't think that went well for me, right? Sometimes it really interferes with our relationship with food in a really negative way. So do I think that old school parenting, clean plate club, finish your plate, you know, you have to eat what's served is the best way and the healthiest way to form a good relationship with food for kids? I do not. However, we perhaps, as usually is when we shift something important like parenting, perhaps we have swung the pendulum a little too far in the other direction. And I say this because now we know we sort of have this epidemic of helicopter parenting where the the 24 hour news cycle, the access to the internet and the media make it so that every terrible thing that happens to every child in the world feels like it's happening in my community, right? Think about that a hundred years ago, if, if a child fell out of a tree and perished in Texas, I live in Michigan. I would never have known about that child. Now we see, you know, the awful report and parents all over America will go, oh my goodness, I don't want my child to climb trees anymore. Oh my goodness, the cantaloupe has E. coli. I don't want my kids to eat the cantaloupe. Or, you know, and we, we have so much fear and we react to that fear with sometimes helicopter parenting. We want to bubble wrap our kids. We want to keep them safe. We want to keep them safe from, you know, being abducted, which of course, statistically, Kids are far more safe now than they were 30, 40, 50 years ago, both physically and, you know, being abducted. But nonetheless, the media has put this fear in our minds and, and we're bubble wrapping, we're helicopter parenting, we're, we're doing things for our kids, we're trying to make their lives easier. Ugh. And unfortunately, kind of like that old school parenting of the 80s, eat your food or else, caused a poor relationship with food, the helicopter parenting it's, it's kind of doing the same thing in the opposite direction, right? We are creating a poor relationship with food for our kids because they have no boundaries. They, they have no direction. They're making too many of their own choices when they're too young and they're not mature enough to do it. And they don't really know, they don't really know what to do with that. So it's helicopter. And, and, and of course, if you're like a helicopter parent, I think you're more likely to like just serve your kids be like, oh, well, I'll just show, you know, I'll just make them their food because they need to be nourished. They need to be, they need to be safe. They need to, right? We, we, if we feel like we have to bubble wrap them, we feel like we have to feed them no matter what. Not that they have to be nourished, but that they have to be fed. They can't be on the low percentile. They got to gain weight. I, I got to make sure that they eat, right? And all that fear and all that anxiety creates more short order cooking, right? Which again has been made easier because of our culture and because of all that convenience food. So first we talk about our culture, kids meals, short order cooking, we talk about helicopter. If we're going a little too far in the pendulum. The third theory of mine, and, and this is a very personal theory. I, I don't know, like I've never done research on this. I don't know if this is true, but, but check me on this. Tell me what you think. I'm super curious. Um, I think in our physiology, uh, we know there are a lot of physical, biological root causes to picky eating. A lot of kids are struggling with texture. They're struggling with sensory processing. They're struggling with their olfactory sense, their sense of smell. Um, I just read an introduction this morning where the mom said, my, my child can barely walk into the kitchen when I'm cooking. His sense of smell is so heightened and, and it just, just about makes him sick. We've got kids who are gagging on their food all the time, like even, you know, not just toddlers, but up to age seven and eight and nine. And wow, talk about anxiety at the table for both child and adult. So we've got a lot, a lot of sensory issues going on and, and we're bringing these to the table and it's causing our kids to not want to eat a whole lot of things, right? And it's increasing their anxiety. Why in the world are we so much more sensitive? Are we? That's, that's my theory. My theory is that highly sensitive people, people with high sensitivity, both physiological and psychological, perhaps are increasing and I wonder if it has to do with the amount of toxins in our world, the toxins we're exposed to even in utero, 
right? Wouldn't that be wild? I wonder if it has to do with, you know, all of our artificial lights and all of our screens and just all of the attacks on our systems that are causing us to not have quite enough resilience. Think about, think about all the products on the market for sensitive people, tagless shirts, right? Seamless socks, like what the underwear has like no tag. And you just, I mean, it's a, it's amazing how many products are on the market for people who have, who are sensitive, sensitive skin, sensitive, whatever. So my theory is that, that the percentage of people who are highly sensitive is increasing. And I, and I just wonder, I question, does it have to do with, with the toxins and the EMFs and everything that our environment is sort of attacking our bodies with that we can only handle so much. I would love to hear in the comments. I'd love to hear um, any, any which way, send me an email. What do you think about that? Do you think that's possible? Cause it's, you know, kids are definitely having sensory issues, definitely increasing picky eating because of it. What's like the, the ultimate root cause of that? I'm not sure. Number four, the final, you know, theoretical root cause of picky eating that's affecting many, many people is psychological. And, and this is research proven. This is an increase in stress. Okay. We know that stress is the number one root cause of many, uh, what is it? Like 80% of doctor visits, I think for adults, we know that one third of our high school kids are clinically depressed or anxious. Um, we know that we know that stress is causing severe psychological and physiological disease, and it's definitely increasing. Um, I interviewed teachers a couple years ago on, on the stress levels in schools and teachers who have been around for like 10, 15, even 20 years, they say like, they don't need research. They can feel it. Kids are coming to school more stressed. Even, even when we're trying to pressure them less academically, they're coming to school more stressed, whether it's because of home life schedules, academics, we don't really know. And they're coming to school less resilient, higher stress, less resilient. And, and what can kids control? when they're feeling out of control, when they're feeling anxious, when they're feeling stressed, mm, they can control what goes in their mouth. And so sometimes for many kids, a reaction to anxiety and stress is to avoid eating and to create a small subset of safe foods and absolutely exclude all other foods because they're scary and that's going to add to their anxiety. Now, ironically, we know a lot of adults stress eat and kids do that too. Kids do that too. But sometimes they stress eat in their, in their lane, in their safe foods, right? Not, not all picky eaters are like thin or emaciated. There are plenty of picky eaters who are, are maybe putting on a couple extra pounds, possibly because their safe foods tend to be the highly processed, the fried, the munchy crunchies, right? The pizza, the pretzels, the chips, the crackers, the peanut butter sandwiches. Um, we, we gravitate toward those comforting foods when we're stressed, even though that's misguided, right? Even though those foods are only going to be a short-term Band-Aid, especially kids, they don't know. They don't know that they shouldn't feed their stress with those foods, right? I mean, adults have a hard enough time. I have a hard enough time not going toward ice cream and chocolate when I'm feeling stressed. So those are my four. Those are my four theories on some of the reasons why picky eating seems to be drastically increased in our kids' generation, right? The culture of kids' meals, lowering the bar, short order cooking, helicopter parenting having shifted from the more strict parenting of the 70s and 80s, our physiology being more highly sensitive, perhaps because of our environment and toxins, and our psychology, that stress has increased and sometimes that causes kids to decrease the number of foods they eat. So if any of these theories are true, and I really believe that at least some of them are, if not all of them, it would, it would lend itself to say, well, now we have a list of four ways that parents, especially parents of little tots, little toddlers and little preschoolers who are still pretty good eaters can prevent picky eating, can do some preventative action, right? So if you're a parent of a really young one, here are four things I want you to do to try to prevent your kids from becoming picky eaters. Now, if your kids are already older, I still think this is really important for you to remember and think of and put into action as well. So first of all, simply commit to no short order cooking. Okay. Yes. The culture makes it easy. Yes. Our kids palates, you know, are, are maybe narrower because of the junk food they're being served at schools. But how do you stop short order cooking? You just do. Okay. It doesn't mean you have to make your kids eat what you make. That's not appropriate. That's not your job. We can't make our kids eat. 
But if you want to not short order cook, if you think that that is something that doesn't serve your kids, P.S. Short order cooking doesn't serve your kids, I promise. And, and just about every parent, I don't know, I think every parent, and I've heard from hundreds, I've heard from hundreds of short order cooking parents, and every single one feels a little guilty, um, feels a little like they wish they could turn back the clock. They feel a little surprised, like, I, I don't really know how this happened. This wasn't my plan, right? And they feel unhappy. They're not happy with the short order cooking, okay? So if you're are not already short order cooking, commit, right? This is something I'm never going to do. Again, doesn't mean your kids have to eat everything. Doesn't mean they're going to eat everything on the table. But you can commit and just choose to never short order cook. Um, I like to tell parents to create your own normal. But this is our normal dinner. And a normal dinner will often have vegetables and variety. The V's, right? Our two normal V's are we're gonna always see some vegetables on there and we're gonna have variety. If you are short order cooking and you need to transfer out of that, keep that variety, right? So maybe you make the chicken nuggets, but you also make two or three other things, right? Maybe you make the French fries so that your kids have a safe food on the table, but you also make two or three other things. That's where variety comes in, where everyone at the table can have something they like, but you're still making one meal, okay? Yeah, you know, yes, a meal can have two or three or four parts, and that's okay. And that just means leftovers, and that's great because I love eating leftovers. They're the easiest way to have lunch. But if you don't want a short order cook, just don't. Just don't. Now, how do we combat number two, helicopter parenting? Well, I just got to tell you, kids do not want another friend, and kids do not really want a servant in their mother or their father, in their parent figure, whoever the adult is in their house, okay? They might act like they do. I mean, it's great. It's fun to be served and have everything done for you. But in reality, kids know that they really want boundaries. That's why when they're toddlers, they try to push those boundaries. They try to figure out where their control stops and where yours starts. And they're going to push as far as they can until you put some control in place. And if you never do, they're kind of lost. They're kind of running around lost. Like, I don't, I'm nervous. I'm scared. It's actually anxiety inducing to have parents who are too laissez-faire, who, who are too much their friend, too much their servant, who don't have any rules or boundaries. And I know helicopter parenting makes it seem like you have a lot of rules and boundaries, which is, you know, ill, Ill formed in another way. But a lot of times helicopter parents are kind of allowing maybe too much to go on. They're allowing their children to have too many choices. So what we want to do is shoot for the middle, create some boundaries within which your child still gets choices. Does that make sense? So anti-helicopter parenting doesn't mean we let them do anything they want, right? Anti-helicopter parenting doesn't mean we set extremely strict rules. It means we set rules that will keep our children safe, that will help them learn, and within which they can have choices. For toddlers, the boundaries are a little smaller. And we begin to open up those boundaries and give our children more and more choices as they grow. Okay, that's, that's a great balance to hit. And there's thousands of ways to do that, right? This isn't like a strict parenting system. I'm just saying helicopter parenting doesn't seem to be serving our kids. So let's try to run away from that as much as we can with consistency, with boundaries, choice, but high expectations. Cool? All right, number three, we talked about that, that physiology, that high sensitivity. So what can we do about that? I mean, I can say, well, maybe it started with toxins, but I don't know. I haven't researched this. So I can't say, well, remove the toxins from your home. But I, I would say, like, let's allow our kids to have preferences, right? If, they, if a child or an adult really has a, a sensory issue, like that food is repulsive to them, right? That food is very, very difficult to get in. So it's not just, you know, they're not just going to eat it just because you say they have to. So I would say, you know, allow preferences without judgment. Okay, we need to allow our kids to have preferences without judgment. Maybe they love crunchy things and they don't like mushy things. There's still a lot of meals we can make. Okay, maybe they have trouble chewing meat unless maybe it's like slow cooker meat or ground meat, right? There are, there are so many ways we can get creative to work within our kids' preferences. And I think particularly when it comes to texture, knowing that so many people, so many human beings in this era have a lot of high sensitivity, we really want to be... Um, responsive to that. We want to be we want to be sensitive about their sensitivity and not judge. Um, 
Also, a quick trick is to allow your kids to have exposure to food without having to eat it, without it having to cross into their mouths. So you might um, do like a Play-Doh type activity with mashed potatoes. Um, you might use the tiny salad trick that I just um, posted and I'll, I'll remember, I'll link that in a comment below. Um, any type of involvement with food, whether it's playing with that food or whether it's cooking and preparing, washing, serving, whatever that food is going to be a good thing for your kids with a little, a little bit of high sensitivity to texture. Okay. Now the fourth underpinning in my theory of picky eating is the stress the stress and the psychology. And of course, you know, I'm a stress mastery educator. We have lots of resources on Kids Cook Real Food and Kitchen Stewardship to, to generally, globally help reduce our stress and our anxiety. But let's just talk today about like stress and anxiety at the table, okay? So what can we do to reduce our kids' stress when they're coming to the table? And by, by golly, to reduce ours as well. And it's to try to dissipate those power struggles, okay? When our kids are coming to the table and when we have those rules like the clean plate club or you have to eat that or we're constantly talking about food and how we want them to eat that and da, 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 and like sort of pushing them toward that food, so many kids are going to resist and, and immediately now we have a power struggle and now we're all stressed and we're all anxious and we're getting the opposite result of that which we intended right? They're going to not eat. They're going to not try new things the more we tell them to eat and try new things. Ugh. So what do we do? Well, I mean, I call it keep a poker face. And in our, in our no more picky eating challenge, this is going to be day four is keeping a poker face. And we talk about how we just serve the food, right? We're just going to serve the food. And we'll, we'll dig so much more into this in the no more picky eating challenge. That I don't even, I don't want to go into it, but the encouragement is if there's stress and anxiety at the table, troubleshoot, talk to your spouse, talk to your kids away from the table, figure out how you can reduce that. Usually, usually the answer is by changing your expectations. Okay. Or by changing the language you use by taking out some of the, some of the, uh, encouragement, maybe the strong encouragement to eat new foods. Cool. All right. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. Really, really curious to hear your thoughts on these four, um, root causes of picky eating. Am I, am I hitting the mark here? Do you see any of these in your family? Do you see any of these in your community? And we've got the culture of kids' meals and highly processed, convenient kids' food, encouraging short order cooking. We've got helicopter parenting, swinging the pendulum perhaps too far back from the strict parenting of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. We've got our high, high stress sensitivity in our, in our physical bodies that's causing a lot of texture issues. And we've got our psycholo uh, psychological stress right? We are more stressed and more anxious, particularly, you know, in the time of pandemic. And so it is my fervent hope that if you've got little tiny ones, that you can set these goals, that you can say, okay, I am not going to be a short order cook. I am not going to be a helicopter parent. I'm not going to be my child's friend or servant. I'm going to give them boundaries within which they can make choices. I'm going to be sensitive to any of their texture issues and try to work within what they can stand and still serve healthy food and not short order cook and work to slowly expand what they're able to, you know, what they're able to um, accept within their, their texture. And I'm going to really try to avoid power struggles at the table. Um, now, these are not easy asks. Okay. These are not easy strategies. And I understand that. And, and, you know, I have four kids and I have definitely 100% engaged in power struggles around food. And I know it. And I see it and I go, oh, shoot, I did it again, right? Because we're not perfect. We make mistakes. But when we do it, we've got we to learn from it. I've, I've learned that with one of my children, if I start talking about food, I just got to stop. And I walk away. And usually within half an hour, that child will nourish him or herself, generally. Not always. But for sure, it's not going to happen if I'm involved. So it's kind of like just like the cat in the corner. Just leave them alone and eventually they'll come around. Now, it doesn't work for everyone, but the power struggles definitely don't work for anyone. I hope this was really helpful. To dig in even more, we are embarking on a five-day, totally free, no more picky eating challenge. It starts tomorrow, April 21st. Um, you could totally join on the 22nd and catch up easily. It's five days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday weekend to catch up in case you get behind and then monday tuesday we glue it all together and make all the strategies make sense the goal is to be super doable for busy parents i just gave you four causes and four solutions that is not what we're doing in the challenge every day 
has one theme and one change that you're going to make in your household that day, see some wins and successes, come back the next day for one more change, okay? Also, we have $3,500 in prizes to give away. I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm not a fan of participation awards. You know that. But getting a prize for doing the good hard work of parenting that you have to do anyway feels pretty good. And I feel pretty good that we have so many generous sponsors giving these prizes away. I'm super pumped about that. So join kidscookrealfood.com slash picky challenge. Click the link below. And I hope to see you in the group there. It's a really robust community of moms and dads who love their kids, who really want to raise healthy, independent adults, but they're a little worried. They're a little worried about how their kids are doing and, and what they're eating. Um, and I hope there weren't any comments on this post because I still can't see them. So we'll find out. I'll answer them uh, in text when I get off. Again, this has been an episode of the Healthy Parenting Connector, the show that connects you parents who really want to raise intentionally healthy, independent adults with the experts who have the information you need. At Kids Cook Real Food, we're all about connecting families around healthy food, building confidence in kids, and infusing creativity into our culture. I'm Katie Kimball, and I will see you again next week. Thanks.